The following video is one of the chapters of my Skillshare course on how to read an academic paper. Hopefully it is helpful to you here on YouTube in isolation, but if you click on the link below the video you can go to the Skillshare course and watch all of the different sections. Okay, in this last section uh, we're going to look just a little bit at making sense of the statistics in an academic paper. So with a scientific paper, it is quite common for it to use quantitative methods and statistics and statistical modeling. Uh, I have a PhD in statistics. This is certainly one of my areas of expertise. Uh, and what we're going to do here is not dive too deep, uh, but just really look at if we were a complete novice, what are some of the things we would expect to see? And what are some of the things we would be on the lookout for? In the future, I will be producing more YouTube and Skillshare content where we dive a lot deeper into statistics and making sense of statistics. Uh, but for today, what we are looking at is really just some basics. So three key areas. Uh, we're going to look at some descriptive statistics, uh, how data might be presented with those. Uh, we are going to look at what's called confidence intervals and p-values. Uh, and these are the most common ways that we will see uh, findings presented. Uh, and then just a little bit about statistical modeling as well. So when we look at descriptive statistics, uh, really this is just telling us about the data. So the different variables that have been collected, uh, what do we see here? So with our categorical variables, it will normally just say what are the different categories? Uh, and what are the counts or what are the percentages for those different categories. For a numeric variable, so something that is measured with a number, uh, we would expect to see some sort of measures of center. Uh, so these would be things like means and medians. So for instance, if we were collecting the ages of all of the participants in a piece of research, what's the average age? What's the average income? So the means and medians will tell us about that. We're also going to be interested in how spread out these numbers are. So the measure most commonly used for that is the standard deviation. Uh, but we might also see the range. So what was the biggest one and what was the smallest one? Uh, but when we see a standard deviation uh, or there's another measure called the standard error, basically all we need to know for today is that those are just a measure of how spread out the numbers are. And the bigger the standard error, or the bigger the standard deviation, then the more spread out it is. When we're looking just at them, there's not really any particular magic number, a standard deviation of three, could be big, could be small, depends what the other standard deviations on the other variables look like. Uh, so really it's a bit of a comparative thing, it's just saying how spread out the numbers are. We sometimes will see correlations. So a correlation is a measure that takes two numeric variables uh, and tells me about the strength of the association between them. So is it positive or negative? So when one goes up, do we tend to see the other one going up or going down? So negative would mean that one goes up, other one tends to go down. Positive would mean when one goes up, other one tends to go up. So correlations give us an indication just between two numeric variables uh, how they might be associated with each other. The other thing that we will sometimes see is some graphs. So the graphs could be of uh, whatever our key measurements are that we are looking at. Quite often these might include what's called confidence intervals. So confidence intervals are a, an interval, so a range, a, number, a range from kind of a, a low number to a high number. And they used to take numbers from a sample and to be able to tell me what I think is going on in the population. Uh, with a certain degree of confidence, so we will normally see 95% uh, or 99% confidence. And really what we're saying is that I have this interval that goes from, from here to here. And with a certain percentage confidence, I think that the population value of whatever I'm measuring is somewhere in that interval. So you can imagine if we were looking at uh, ages, we had our average age, and instead of just saying the average age is 27, uh, we might calculate the confidence interval for this. And instead of saying just the average age, the mean age is 27, uh, we might have a confidence interval that goes from 25 to 29. 
And so what we would be saying with that is we are certain confidence and normally pretty high confidence that uh, based on this sample, we think that the population figure somewhere between 25 and 29. So it gives us a degree of precision. Instead of quoting just a single number, we have a little bit of precision there. If we had a wider interval, so instead of 25 to 29, uh, it went from 20 to 42, uh, then that would show us that we had a lot less precision. And in fact, if we were estimating an average age and it was anywhere between 20 and 40, it's probably not actually very useful. So we get that idea of precision. Uh, and so we'll see confidence intervals used uh, for our means. Uh, they can be used for proportions and percentages. Uh, and they can also be used for figures in our statistical models. So where we're looking at how big a difference is, or we're looking at the effect of one variable on another variable, uh, then a confidence interval will give us a that interval um, that, that will give us just kind of a little bit more information than if we were looking at a single figure. The other technical detail we will see all the time is what's called p-values. So a p-value is a probability, uh, and basically, uh, kind of taking a little bit of the technicality away from it, uh, but it's in, in kind of a slightly loose sense saying, what's the chance, what's the probability that I would see these outcomes right here just by chance? And if we have a very small p-value, so we're saying, well, the chance of this happening, chance of seeing this particular sample, uh, the chance of seeing a difference in scores between the group that took the drug and the group that didn't take the drug, uh, if this probability or this p-value is very small, then it's unlikely that this happened by chance. And if it's unlikely it happened by chance, then that difference or whatever it is that I'm testing, um, I think that there is some sort of statistical effect there. The number that is often used as a benchmark is 0.05. Uh, but this can vary a little bit, and papers will often have little asterisks or other symbols that indicate uh, this, what we call statistical significance. So do we think that this value or this effect or this difference is significant? Okay, so when we're looking at our papers, confidence intervals, p-values, we're going to see all the time. Uh, we need to get a little bit familiar with them, uh, but really they are just telling me about precision, and they're telling me about whether I think something happened by chance or it was actually a real effect or a real difference. So the last thing that we will see uh, is statistical models, or what we might call statistical inference. So inference is where we take a sample, and we use that sample to try and determine things about population. So we could be trying to compare uh, differences, so differences between groups, uh, we might be doing what's called regression modeling, where we're trying to model a, uh, a dependent or an outcome variable based on a set of independent uh, or predictive variables. So let's have a look at a particular outcome and how do each of these different things all together affect uh, that outcome. So many, particularly if we're looking at things like economics, a lot of medical papers, uh, we will see these often presented with algebraic formula. Uh, if you are not mathematically inclined and you haven't been trained in this, really I would not worry about those very much at all. Uh, we'll have a look at an example shortly, but really other than seeing particular symbols representing particular variables or pieces of information, I would not worry too much about trying to understand the algebra. Instead, I would focus on what we see in, in the results, uh, I'd be looking at the confidence intervals and the p-values, and then I would be reading uh, the results and the discussion where the authors are talking about the findings. So for us, uh, we want to try and look for some small or highlighted p-values. They will be telling us about where there is statistically significant differences or effects. And then we want to look at uh, what's called the effect size or the effects or the coefficients. They tell us about how uh, the different variables affect each other. And then there might sometimes also be probabilities or what's called odds ratios. And they're really just telling us about the likelihood of something happening. 
So if we were looking at perhaps medical research, uh, they will often use odds ratios. And really they'll be talking about things like uh, the odds or the likelihood, say, uh, that a smoker would get cancer versus a non-smoker. So I'd be talking about those relative likelihoods of things happening. This is an area where we could really go on and on. I uh, really, in just a very short time, wanted to try and capture the key things to be looking at for someone that is very new to this, uh, but certainly keep an eye out for more resources uh, in the future uh, where I will dive much deeper into these topics. So let's take a look at the statistics in a couple of these articles. Each one is looking at uh, slightly different things, but we can see, and as we go in the other ones, we'll see that p-values uh, will be appearing in all of them. In this case, with the p-values, uh, effect sizes. So how big is the effect? Uh, and in this case, the effect that they were looking at uh, was the effect of smoking on IQ. So we can see that there's these figures that are quoted here in the abstract. Uh, if we scroll down to our results, we can see here the they start off with a couple of descriptive statistics. So the mean IQ, so we've got the means for the non-smokers, the smokers, the standard deviations. And so here is where we can see that non-smokers have an average IQ of 100, smokers have an average IQ of 95. But what we want to do with our statistical tests is we want to see whether, based on the sample figures, whether we would expect the population to have a difference here. So when we're talking about these effect sizes and these p-values, that's really what we're doing is we're saying, based on the sample, do I think that this difference is by chance or do I think there is actually a genuine difference here? And so we can look over at the p-values, and remember the p-values we're interested in are small ones, in particular less than 0.05. And we can see here, comparing non-smokers to smokers, the p-value, it isn't actually zero, it will just be so small that when we present it in three decimal places, it looks like zero. But it'll actually be 0 0.0000, and then eventually there'll be some digits in there. As we scroll down, they get a little bit more complicated. Uh, by looking at socioeconomic status with smokers and non-smokers uh, to be able to do more comparisons. And again, each time here we can see a much larger p-value that's telling me there's not a significant difference. So for SES2, comparing the non-smokers with the former smokers, and we can see non-smokers IQ 99.5, uh, average IQ for the former smokers 98.5, this p-value says that we don't think that there is actually a significant difference there. So we don't think that based on these figures, we would expect a difference in the population mean IQs. So those are the kind of things that we would be looking for. If we come across to this next one, the effect of TV on children's well-being, uh, we can see that with this one, there's some confidence intervals. So remember a confidence interval is just giving me an interval rather than a single number as an estimate. And if we scroll down, we have these tables. So these tables, they are, they've done what's called a regression analysis. And what they're looking at is the effect of these particular things. So sex, cognitive ability on the televiewing. Uh, and then down here, uh, turning it around and saying, okay, well, actually, what we really want to know about is the academic performance based on the, the tele viewing, so watching the television, but controlling for all of these other things as well. And with this particular one, uh, the p-values, in the table, they've got these uh, footnotes here, b and c, which is showing us the smaller p-values. So rather than just having to look at the figures themselves. They will look for p-values. Instead, they've just got these little shortcuts here. So we're looking in particular for the b's. Uh, they are the ones that are telling me that this, this particular variable, uh, so for instance, maternal education has a significant effect on mathematical success. Uh, and if we had looked at other research, we'd find that that's actually very common 
maternal education being an impact, uh, having an influence uh, on educational outcomes. So let's look at one more. And so here with this one, this is an example of where the statistical models are presented using uh, a lot of algebra up front. And if this is completely foreign to you, uh, my advice is more or less to ignore it. So as we read through, uh, there might be some descriptions in here. So where they're saying, well, we want module educational attainment and we're using household, neighborhood and ethnic characteristics. Uh, those words describing it, that's all we need to know. We don't need to worry about any any of these mathematical representations. Uh, we can really just leave that for people that have been trained in it. Uh, focus on those uh, written descriptions and then get down into the actual results. And so when we get down into the actual results, again here, uh, this has been a particular statistical model. Uh, they're looking at the effect of uh, these different uh, ethnic groups. And with the searching for p-values again, uh, this time they're using asterisks. And this is probably actually more common. The, the one we just looked at with the A's and B's is less common. But here, uh, looking at asterisks, so two asterisks denotes significance at 5%. And that just means a p-value less than 0.05. Uh, one asterisk is significant 10%. I wouldn't really be looking for that. I myself would always be looking for much lower than 0.05. So where we see the double asterisk, that is the bits that's telling me uh, that there, in this case, is a significant effect in this model. Um, there's not quite enough information here in this table. We'd need to go through and uh, read some of the blurb here uh, where they are describing what's going on in this table um, but in terms of the key bits from the table we're just looking for the small p-values uh, and they are denoted with the asterisks. So this has really just been a very brief look at the some of the statistics presented in a couple of papers really just to help familiarize yourself and to show that even though there's going to be potentially some complex things so sometimes there's uh, equations and Greek letters and things like that uh, we can really look past that and don't get overwhelmed by that uh, and really just focus on where there's written explanations so for instance here where they're talking about the different variables um, that's something we can certainly understand so country of origin for the mother and the father uh, this is looking at educational attainment uh, and ethnicity so looking at these descriptions and really focusing on uh, focusing on the writing if we do look at the results tables just looking at those effects and looking at those p-values just to have a, a cursory look and, and just a basic understanding Thanks for watching this video. Please like and subscribe to support more academic content for masters and PhD students who are embarking on their research journey. Also see below the video for links to our YouTube, Facebook community and Skillshare.